Have you ever wondered how a routine trip to the grocery store could turn into a spine-chilling mystery? Tonight, we delve deep into one of the most twisted cases you've never heard of, the haunting story of Heather Stroob. It's a tale that will make you question everything you know about the people closest to you. Stay with us until the end, as we unravel the dark and unsettling events that still haunt investigators to this day. Buckle up, because this bedtime story is not for the faint of heart. Heather Stroob was a young woman full of life and promise. Born and raised in the quiet suburbs of Atlanta, she was known for her warm smile and kind-hearted nature. Friends and family often described her as a devoted mother and a loving daughter, someone who always put others first. Heather had a passion for floral design, which led her to work at a local florist shop, where she crafted beautiful arrangements that brought joy to many. Her days were filled with the routine hustle of balancing work and motherhood, as she cared for her young son, Carson, who was the light of her life. Heather's personality was a blend of determination and grace. She was resilient, always finding a way to overcome life's challenges with a positive outlook. Her life seemed picture perfect, a testament to her hard work and dedication to her family and career. But beneath the surface of this seemingly idyllic existence, dark clouds were gathering, setting the stage for a mystery that would baffle even the most seasoned investigators. The day of the incident, Heather Strube woke up early to start her usual routine. She made breakfast for her son Carson, ensuring he had his favorite cereal and a glass of orange juice. Afterward, she got him ready for the day, dressing him in his favorite outfit and packing his little backpack. They shared a few laughs over a silly cartoon on TV, a precious mother-son moment that seemed ordinary yet was filled with love and tenderness. Heather had planned to meet her estranged husband, Stephen, later that afternoon to exchange custody of Carson. Despite their recent separation, Heather maintained a calm and composed demeanor, always prioritizing her son's well-being above all else. After dropping Carson off at daycare, Heather headed to her job at the florist shop. She spent the morning arranging a stunning bouquet for a wedding, her skilled hands transforming a collection of flowers into a work of art. Her co-workers noticed she seemed a bit distracted, but she brushed it off, explaining she was just busy with the upcoming arrangements and errands she had to run. By mid-afternoon, Heather left work to run some personal errands. She stopped by the grocery store to pick up a few essentials, a routine task she performed without a second thought. Little did she know her every move was being watched. At around 3 p.m., Heather arrived at the Target parking lot to meet Stephen. It was a public place, chosen for its safety and convenience. She parked her car and walked towards Stephen's vehicle, holding Carson's hand, unaware of the dark presence lurking in the shadows. After a brief exchange, Heather and Carson walked back to her car. Just as she was strapping him into his car seat, a figure emerged from a nearby vehicle, Dressed in a disguise, the figure approached with a calm yet determined stride. Before Heather could react, a gun was drawn, and in an instant, the air was pierced with a deafening shot. Heather Stroob fell, mortally wounded, as the assailant fled the scene. Carson, still strapped in his car seat, began to cry, his tiny voice mingling with the fading echoes of the gunshot. Witnesses called 911, and police arrived swiftly, but by then, Heather was gone, leaving behind a stunned and grieving community. This heinous act, committed in broad daylight, left investigators scrambling for answers as they pieced together the events of that fateful afternoon. Heather Strube's life 
so full of promise and love, was cruelly cut short, and the hunt for her killer had just begun. The Target shopping center was a common suburban hub, a place where families felt safe and errands were just a part of daily life. The parking lot was expansive, filled with rows of cars neatly lined up. Shoppers moved to and fro, pushing carts loaded with groceries, chatting on phones, or corralling children as they navigated the myriad tasks of modern life. The sun was bright, casting sharp shadows on the asphalt, but an air of ordinariness cloaked the scene. It was a typical weekday afternoon, with nothing particularly memorable about the day, until the tragic event unfolded. The store itself was a large, boxy structure, painted in the familiar red and white colors, with bold signage that beckoned shoppers from the main road. Surrounding the parking lot were small landscaped islands, dotted with young trees and shrubs, trying to bring a touch of greenery to the concrete sprawl. The area seemed benign, almost comforting in its routine, but it was precisely this familiarity that added a chilling layer to the incident. Nestled between the rows of parked cars, shadows could easily hide a lurking presence, unnoticed by the bustling crowd. Heather Strube had parked her car near one of these islands, a detail that seemed insignificant at the time, but would later be etched in the memories of all who witnessed the tragedy. The usual sights and sounds of suburban life continued uninterrupted until the calm was shattered by the sudden act of violence. The peaceful facade of the shopping center was forever marred by the horror that took place, casting a long, dark shadow over what was once just another ordinary place. The crime scene was like a moment suspended in time, a snapshot of a horrifying reality that seemed almost surreal. The perpetrator moved with unnerving calmness, blending into the ordinary hustle and bustle of the target parking lot. Eyewitnesses would later recall the shock of seeing the assailant, dressed in a meticulous disguise, approach Heather with an almost methodical precision. The bright afternoon sun cast stark shadows on the ground, amplifying the sudden eruption of chaos. As Heather turned to secure Carson into his car seat, she was blindsided by the looming figure. The gun, cold and unyielding, was brandished with a deliberate motion, and in a chilling moment, the trigger was pulled. The sound of the gunshot echoed through the parking lot, shattering the mundane sounds of everyday life. In broad daylight, in the midst of what seemed like another routine day, Heather's life was violently extinguished. Heather collapsed to the ground, her vibrant life reduced to a tragic scene of despair. The sight was jarring, the reality of it incomprehensible to those who witnessed it. The assailant, with a heartless efficiency, vanished from the scene, leaving behind a mother and son, torn apart in a matter of seconds. Carson's cries pierced through the sudden silence, a young child's voice lost in the wake of such senseless violence. Onlookers stood frozen, the gravity of what had transpired slowly sinking in. Calls to 911 were frantic, filled with disbelief and fear. First responders arrived swiftly, their faces a mix of professional urgency and personal sorrow at the scene that greeted them. Heather was beyond saving, her life stolen in a moment of brutal finality. The target parking lot, once a symbol of suburban normalcy, had become a macabre tableau of loss and grief. The murder in broad daylight, amidst the ordinary routines of life, left the community in a state of collective shock and mourning. Even the most seasoned investigators were left grappling with the audacity and brutality of the crime, as they began their quest to unmask the killer hiding behind the disguise. The immediate reaction of witnesses 
and bystanders at the scene was one of utter disbelief and shock. People who had just moments before been engrossed in their daily errands were suddenly thrust into a nightmare scenario. Some dropped their shopping bags, their contents spilling onto the asphalt as they stared, frozen in place. Others instinctively ducked or ran for cover, their hearts pounding in fear. The scene was chaotic, a stark contrast to the mundane afternoon that had preceded the violence. People shouted, some in panic, others calling for help, their voices blending into a cacophony of terror and confusion. Within seconds, what had been an ordinary parking lot became a scene of horror, an image seared into the minds of those present. A woman who had been loading groceries into a car stood transfixed, her hands trembling as she dialed 911, her voice breaking as she tried to describe the unimaginable scene unfolding before her eyes. Another witness, a store employee on a break, rushed inside to alert security, his face pale as he tried to make sense of the chaos. Parents shielded their children, turning them away from the grim sight, their own expressions a mix of fear and helplessness. Cars screeched to a halt, drivers craning their necks to see what had caused the sudden commotion. Within moments, the target parking lot was filled with a sense of collective horror. The routine of daily life shattered by the brutal act of violence they had just witnessed. As first responders arrived, their flashing lights and wailing sirens adding to the surreal atmosphere. Witnesses began to process the reality of what had happened. Some wept openly, their sobs a poignant counterpoint to the frenzied activity around them. Others stood in stunned silence, their minds struggling to comprehend the senseless tragedy that had just unfolded. The initial shock wave rippled through the community, leaving everyone grappling with a profound sense of loss and vulnerability. The once familiar and safe environment now felt tainted, the remnants of a life cruelly taken lingering in the air. The shock of Heather Strube's murder spread quickly, with each witness carrying the heavy burden of what they had seen, forever marked by the haunting memory of that fateful afternoon. The initial suspect in this twisted tale was cloaked in a disguise that surprised everyone. Witnesses described the figure as wearing a dark colored wig, oversized sunglasses, and a cap pulled low over their face. This ensemble was designed to obscure any recognizable features, casting an eerie shadow over their identity. The killer moved with a cool precision their disguise enhancing the air of mystery and menace. As Heather turned to buckle Carson into his car seat, the assailant's footsteps were steady, almost calculated, closing the distance with alarming speed. One eyewitness, who had been parking her car nearby, recalled the disguised figure's calm demeanor. From the moment the perpetrator brandished the gun to the instant they fled the scene, it was clear this was not a random act. The disguise was meticulously chosen, not just to avoid recognition, but to blend seamlessly into the everyday hustle of the parking lot. The oversized sunglasses masked their eyes, hiding any hint of emotion, while the wig and cap altered their appearance enough to evade immediate identification. The killer's attire combined with their deliberate actions, painted a chilling portrait of premeditation. The disguise wasn't just a protective measure, it was a calculated element in executing a heinous plan. The police soon realized that unmasking the identity behind this careful facade would be a daunting task. The community, still reeling from the shock, struggled to believe that someone could carry out such a brutal act with such cold efficiency. The hunt was now on, not just for a murderer, but for the true face hidden beneath the disguise that had turned a peaceful afternoon 
into a nightmare. Investigators had to sift through the chaos, hoping to find a clue that would lead them to the person responsible for shattering so many lives. The car chase that followed the murder was nothing short of a cinematic thriller. As the assailant fled the scene, a few quick-thinking witnesses managed to catch a glimpse of the getaway vehicle, a dark sedan with tinted windows. The information was relayed to the 911 operator, and within minutes a police pursuit was underway. Sirens blared as squad cars raced towards the main road, their lights slicing through the chaos of the parking lot. The dark sedan sped down the suburban streets, weaving through traffic with reckless abandon. The driver, determined to escape, navigated the twists and turns with an almost uncanny skill, the car's tires screeching against the pavement. Adrenaline pumped through the veins of the pursuing officers, their focus razor sharp as they tried to anticipate the suspect's next move. The chase led them through a maze of residential neighborhoods where families watched in stunned silence from their porches, and children playing outside were quickly ushered indoors. The suspect's vehicle darted through intersections, barely avoiding collisions as the officers maintained a tight formation, their training kicking in to handle the high-speed pursuit. The tension was palpable, each passing second bringing them closer to either capturing the suspect or losing them in the labyrinth of suburban streets. Suddenly the dark sedan made a sharp turn onto a narrow, tree-lined road, accelerating as it headed towards the outskirts of town. The police cars followed in hot pursuit, their engines roaring as they pushed the limits of their vehicles. The road became increasingly winding and treacherous, with the dense foliage on either side casting eerie shadows in the fading light of the afternoon. The suspect's driving grew even more erratic, swerving dangerously close to the edge of the road, but the officers remained relentless. As the chase continued, the road opened up into a stretch of highway, offering a brief moment of respite before the pursuit intensified once more. The dark sedan veered off an exit ramp, leading the chase into an industrial area filled with warehouses and abandoned lots. The contrast between the quiet suburban streets and the stark, desolate landscape was jarring, adding a new layer of tension to the unfolding drama. In the midst of this high-stakes game of cat and mouse, the suspect made a desperate move attempting to lose the officers by darting into a construction site. The car skidded on the gravel, sending clouds of dust into the air as it maneuvered around the obstacles. The police cars followed, their headlights cutting through the haze as they closed in on the fleeing vehicle. The suspect's car finally emerged from the construction site onto a deserted road, but it was clear that their vehicle had taken a beating. Smoke began to billow from under the hood, and the car started to slow down, the once precise driving now faltering. Realizing that escape was slipping away, the suspect made one last, desperate attempt to evade capture, swerving erratically across the road. It was then that the lead police car managed to execute a precision pit maneuver, causing the dark sedan to spin out of control before coming to a screeching halt. Officers quickly surrounded the vehicle, guns drawn, as they ordered the suspect to surrender. The door opened slowly, and to everyone's shock, the driver, still partially disguised, stepped out with their hands raised. The dramatic car chase had come to an end, but the quest to uncover the true identity of Heather Strube's murderer was only just beginning. The dark sedan, once a symbol of escape, now stood as a testament to the relentless pursuit of justice in the wake of a senseless tragedy. The initial investigation 
and Leeds began with intense scrutiny of the crime scene. Investigators meticulously collected evidence from Heather Stroop's car and the surrounding area. They examined the bullets, hoping to trace the firearm used. Surveillance footage from the target parking lot was reviewed, showing a dark sedan leaving the scene. This footage was vital, providing the first solid lead in a case marked by uncertainty. Eyewitnesses were interviewed extensively, offering descriptions of the assailant's disguise and the getaway vehicle. One witness remembered a distinctive sticker on the car's rear bumper, a small but potentially critical detail. Another noted a unique gait in the perpetrator's walk, a clue that suggested the killer might have a physical characteristic that could be identified. The police also turned their attention to Heather's personal life. They interviewed her friends, family and co-workers, trying to understand if someone close to her had a motive. Heather's estranged husband, Stephen, was among the first to be questioned. Their recent separation made him a person of interest, but his alibi appeared strong. He provided a timeline of his movements corroborated by phone records and witness statements. Despite this, detectives felt there was more to explore in his relationship with Heather. They dug deeper, examining their custody battle and any recent conflicts that might have escalated to violence. Parallel to this, investigators looked into Heather's professional life. They interviewed her colleagues at the florist shop, searching for any workplace disputes or suspicious behavior. Although nothing significant surfaced, they didn't discount the possibility that someone outside her immediate circle could be involved. The police also tracked down any individuals who had recently interacted with Heather through her work, hoping to find someone who might have harbored a grudge or exhibited strange behavior. Digital forensics played a crucial role as well. Authorities combed through Heather's phone records, emails, and social media accounts. They sought any hint of communication that might reveal threats or conflicts. This exhaustive digital footprint analysis required time, but it was essential in painting a complete picture of Heather's life and any hidden dangers she might have faced. Meanwhile, the distinctive elements of the assailant's disguise kept investigators on high alert. They canvassed local costume and party stores, looking for recent purchases of wigs, sunglasses, and other related items. Shop owners and employees were questioned, but no clear leads emerged from this angle. Yet, the specificity of the disguise suggested premeditation and familiarity with Heather's routines. As days turned into weeks, the community's sense of safety remained shattered, and investigators felt the mounting pressure to solve the case. They continued to follow every lead no matter how small, and coordinated with other law enforcement agencies to expand their search. Haley, a witness who had initially been too traumatized to speak, eventually came forward with a crucial piece of information. She recalled seeing a figure lurking near the parking lot days before the murder, matching the description of the disguised assailant. This sighting hinted at premeditated stalking, providing a new direction for the investigation. The early stages of the investigation were marked by an exhaustive effort to piece together Heather's last moments and identify her killer. Despite the challenges, investigators remained relentless, driven by the need to bring justice to Heather Strub and closure to her grieving family and community. The next logical step in this twisted tale is to delve into Heather's personal life, exploring the relationships and background that might unveil potential motives for her tragic demise. 
Heather Strube's life, though outwardly serene, was woven with complex personal dynamics. Her separation from Stephen Strube, her estranged husband, was a significant element in this intricate web. Their relationship had once been a source of joy, beginning with a whirlwind romance that quickly led to marriage. However, like many relationships, it faced its share of challenges. Financial strains, differing priorities, and escalating tensions gradually eroded their bond. Their separation, though amicable to the outside world, was fraught with underlying conflicts, particularly around the custody of their young son, Carson. Stephen was known to have a fiery temperament, often clashing with Heather over parenting decisions. Friends and family recalled heated arguments that hinted at deeper issues. Despite these disputes, Heather always aimed to keep the peace, prioritizing Carson's well-being. She believed in maintaining a cordial relationship with Stephen for the sake of their son, even if it meant suppressing her own grievances. This selflessness, while admirable, also meant that many of the issues between them remained unresolved, simmering beneath the surface. Stephen's alibi for the day of the murder seemed solid, but investigators could not ignore the possibility that he might have had deeper, more hidden motives. Beyond her relationship with Stephen, Heather's personal life included a network of friends and colleagues who greatly admired her. Her closest friends described her as a pillar of strength and kindness, always ready to lend a helping hand or a listening ear. However, even those closest to her noticed subtle changes in her demeanor in the weeks leading up to the incident. Heather had confided in a few friends about feeling watched or followed, an uneasy sensation she couldn't quite shake off. She brushed it off as paranoia, but now, in hindsight, these admissions took on a chilling significance. Heather's career as a florist brought her into contact with many people, and while most interactions were positive, there were occasional unsettling encounters. One particular incident involved a disgruntled customer who had been overly aggressive about a botched floral arrangement. Although Heather had resolved the issue professionally, the memory of the confrontation lingered. This individual was later questioned by police, but had a solid alibi and no apparent motive for violence. Yet the encounter remained another piece in the puzzle of Heather's increasingly complex life. Heather's family, while supportive, also had their struggles. Her parents, deeply affected by the separation, provided emotional and at times financial support. Their close-knit relationship with Heather and Carson meant they were keenly aware of the pressures she faced, but even they were surprised by the intensity and suddenness of the tragedy that struck their family. Her mother, in particular, recalled a conversation where Heather expressed fears about her safety, a concern that seemed to come out of nowhere and now painted a sobering picture of the dangers she sensed, but couldn't quite identify. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered layers of Heather's relationships that, on the surface, seemed typical of a young mother juggling work and family, but underneath held potential clues to her untimely death. Each person in her circle was scrutinized, their interactions with Heather analyzed for any signs of animosity or hidden agendas. The complexity of Heather's personal life, with its blend of loving relationships and underlying tensions, provided a fertile ground for potential motives each thread needing careful unraveling to understand the true catalyst behind this horrifying act. The search for Heather Strube's killer was as much about piecing together the fragments of her life as it was about tracking down a cold-blooded murderer, a task that would challenge even the most seasoned investigators. 
the investigation soon turned its focus on Heather's close associates, those who shared her daily life and knew her best. As investigators delved deeper, they uncovered a tangled web of relationships that seemed serene on the surface, but were teeming with unspoken tensions and unresolved conflicts. One of the prime subjects of interest was Stephen Strub, Heather's estranged husband. Despite his seemingly solid alibi, Stephen's fiery temper and ongoing custody battle with Heather made him a person of significant interest. Interviews with friends and family painted a picture of a man deeply frustrated by the separation, particularly the limitations it imposed on his time with their son, Carson. Stephen's confrontations with Heather while viewed through the lens of parental concern, revealed underlying hostility that investigators couldn't ignore. Each interaction they had in the weeks leading up to the murder was meticulously reviewed, searching for any hint of escalating aggression that might have pushed Stephen over the edge. The investigation didn't stop with Stephen. Heather's close friends and co-workers were brought in for questioning. Among them was her best friend, Lisa, who had known Heather since high school. Lisa described a bond that was more like sisterhood, filled with shared secrets and unwavering support. Yet, even in this strong friendship, tensions had started to creep in. Heather had recently confided in Lisa about feeling uneasy, a suspicion that someone was watching her. Lisa admitted dismissing these concerns at the time, attributing them to stress from the separation. This revelation cast a new light on their relationship, leading investigators to scrutinize Lisa's interactions and possible knowledge of any threats to Heather's safety. Heather's colleagues at the florist shop were also under the microscope, her boss, Mr. Thompson, a stern but fair manager, had always appreciated Heather's dedication and creativity. However, beneath his professional demeanor, he harbored a strict approach to business that sometimes clashed with Heather's more compassionate side. Heather had once stood up to Thompson over a mistreatment of a fellow employee, an act of defiance that strained their professional relationship. While this seemed like a minor workplace conflict in the context of a murder investigation, it was flagged for deeper examination. Could there have been more underlying resentment than anyone had realized? Another focal point was Heather's neighbor, Mrs. Green, an elderly woman who lived next door. Known for her nosy nature, Mrs. Green had an uncanny knack for observing the goings-on in the neighborhood. She provided detailed accounts of Heather's routine and any unfamiliar cars or visitors she had noticed. Her observations were both a treasure trove of information and a potential source of confusion, given her tendency to embellish details. Yet her recollection of seeing a dark sedan parked near Heather's house on multiple occasions couldn't be ignored and added a new layer of complexity to the case. As investigators mapped out these intricate relationships, they faced the daunting task of separating genuine concern from possible ulterior motives. Each person close to Heather became a potential suspect, their lives and interactions dissected with meticulous care. The focus shifted from merely understanding the crime scene to penetrating the social dynamics that surrounded Heather. Through this process, the true nature of Heather's relationships began to emerge, revealing fractures and tensions that had long been hidden. The suspicion falling on Heather's inner circle highlighted the often unseen emotional currents that can run beneath the surface of close relationships. It became clear that solving Heather's murder required not only uncovering physical evidence, but also understanding the personal connections and emotional landscapes 
that shaped her world. The investigators were now not just hunting for a killer, but also untangling the complex web of human relationships that could hold the key to unlocking the mystery of Heather Strube's untimely death. The role of surveillance footage in unraveling the mystery behind Heather Strube's murder cannot be overstated. Surveillance cameras, often overlooked in the hustle of daily life, became silent witnesses to the crime, capturing critical moments that would ultimately guide investigators toward the suspect. With the target parking lot being a busy suburban hub, multiple cameras were positioned strategically around the area, each capturing different angles of the scene. The footage from these cameras was meticulously collected and reviewed by the investigation team, providing a timeline of events that was indispensable to the case. One of the key pieces of footage came from a camera positioned near the entrance of the Target store. This camera had a clear view of the parking lot where Heather had parked her car. As the team analyzed the video, they saw Heather arriving with Carson, walking hand in hand towards Stephen's vehicle. The exchange between Heather and Stephen was brief, but the camera captured every moment offering a glimpse into the final minutes before the tragedy. More importantly, the same footage showed a dark sedan lurking in the background, its tinted windows concealing the driver's identity. This vehicle had not been noticed by witnesses initially, but its presence became a significant clue. Another camera, located near the parking lot's perimeter, captured a different perspective this angle showed the dark sedan moving slowly through the lot, circling as if searching for a specific spot. The vehicle finally parked a few rows away from Heather's car, a detail that corroborated witness accounts of a suspicious vehicle. The footage showed the driver stepping out in the now infamous disguise, dark-colored wig, oversized sunglasses, and a cap and walking towards Heather's car with a determined stride. These visuals provided a chilling confirmation of the eyewitness descriptions and underscored the premeditated nature of the attack. Further surveillance footage inside the Target store also played a crucial role. The dark sedan was seen entering the parking lot from a nearby street, captured by a camera mounted outside a neighboring business this additional footage allowed investigators to track the vehicle's movements before and after the murder, creating a comprehensive map of the suspect's actions. The investigators pieced together these segments to understand the suspect's route, both arriving and fleeing the scene, which proved essential in narrowing down potential leads. Analyzing the footage, Investigators noticed a distinctive bumper sticker on the dark sedan, a detail that had been mentioned by one of the witnesses, but was now visibly confirmed. This small yet significant identifier became a pivotal clue in tracing the vehicle. Law enforcement agencies extended their search to databases of registered vehicles with matching descriptions and began canvassing local neighborhoods for a car with that specific bumper sticker. Surveillance footage from nearby traffic lights and businesses helped to further corroborate the timeline. Cameras captured the sedan speeding away from the target parking lot, passing through several intersections before finally disappearing from view. By synchronizing these recordings, investigators were able to pinpoint the vehicle's direction and approximate speed, leading them to speculate about potential hiding spots or safe houses in the surrounding areas. The breakthrough came when a resident from a nearby suburb called in a tip about a vehicle matching the description parked in a secluded cul-de-sac. Police quickly responded and after a thorough investigation, they identified the vehicle as the one seen in the surveillance footage. This led to the arrest of a suspect, 
who was found with items matching the disguise worn during the attack. The surveillance footage had provided the crucial links needed to bring the suspect into custody, transforming what seemed like an unsolvable case into a pursuit for justice. The role of surveillance footage in this investigation illuminated the power of technology in modern policing. By capturing the unfiltered, objective truth of the events as they unfolded, these silent witnesses brought clarity to the chaotic aftermath of the crime. The footage did more than just record a crime. It narrated the story in frames, each detail adding depth to the investigation and bringing investigators one step closer to solving the case. The arrest of Jenna Wall was a turning point in the investigation into Heather Stroop's murder. Jenna, Heather's mother-in-law, was initially seen as a grieving relative, but as investigators dug deeper, unsettling details emerged that shifted the focus onto her. Jenna Wall's relationship with Heather had always been strained. Known for her domineering personality, Jenna often clashed with Heather, especially regarding the upbringing of Carson. Their disputes were well known among family and friends, adding a layer of bitter tension to an already complex family dynamic. Investigators first considered Jenna a person of interest when an anonymous tip suggested she had been unusually vocal about her disapproval of Heather in the weeks leading up to the murder. This prompted a closer look at her activities and alibis. Jenna's movements on the day of the murder raised immediate red flags. Her claim of being home alone was difficult to verify, and her demeanor during police interviews showed signs of nervousness and evasiveness that experienced detectives noted. A breakthrough came when digital forensics revealed a series of text messages between Jenna and an unknown number. The messages, retrieved from her phone, contained ominous hints about teaching Heather a lesson and cryptic references to a plan that would ensure Stephen gained full custody of Carson. These messages alone were not enough to convict Jenna but they provided a chilling insight into her mindset and potential motives. The second piece of damning evidence came from the forensic analysis of the dark sedan used in the getaway. The vehicle, registered to a distant relative of Jenna, had been impounded and thoroughly investigated. Fibers matching a wig and sunglasses found in Jenna's home were discovered in the car, directly linking her to the disguise witnesses described. Forensic experts also found traces of Jenna's DNA inside the vehicle, further cementing her connection to the scene of the crime. Investigators also focused on surveillance footage that captured a figure resembling Jenna near Heather's home on several occasions in the weeks before the murder. This pattern of behavior suggested premeditation and stalking, adding to the weight of evidence against her. Eyewitnesses, who initially described the assailant as unrecognizable due to the disguise, began to recall details that matched Jenna's appearance underneath the costume, reinforcing the case against her. The tipping point came when a search of Jenna's residence uncovered a detailed journal outlining her grievances against Heather. The entries were filled with vitriolic commentary and plans to remove Heather from Stephen and Carson's lives. This journal, combined with the text messages, surveillance footage and physical evidence, painted a comprehensive picture of premeditated murder driven by personal vendetta and a desire to control her grandson's future. Jenna Wall was arrested at her home early one morning the culmination of weeks of painstaking investigation. The arrest was swift and methodical, with officers reading her rights as they led her to the patrol car. Jenna's reaction was a mix of defiance and shock, a stark contrast to the calm demeanor 
she had projected during the early stages of the investigation. She maintained her innocence, but the mountain of evidence against her told a different story. The news of Jenna's arrest sent shockwaves through the community, a sobering reminder of the dark currents that can run beneath the surface of seemingly normal relationships. Heather's family and friends were both relieved and horrified, struggling to reconcile the image of a beloved grandmother with the cold-blooded planner of such a heinous crime. Jenna Wall's arrest marked a significant step towards justice for Heather Strube, bringing some measure of closure to a family and community left reeling by her tragic death. The court proceedings and trial of Jenna Wall were marked by dramatic revelations and intense emotions. As the trial commenced, the courtroom was filled with members of the community, family, friends, and media representatives, all eager to witness how justice would be served. The prosecution, led by a seasoned district attorney, meticulously laid out their case against Jenna Wall, painting a vivid picture of premeditated murder driven by deep-seated animosity towards Heather Strube. They began with opening statements that highlighted the evidence collected, the motive, and the premeditation involved in the crime. Jenna Wall sat stoically, her expression unreadable as the prosecution began to unravel the events leading up to Heather's tragic death. The prosecution's case was built on a foundation of forensic evidence and witness testimonies. They presented the surveillance footage that captured the dark sedan and the disguised figure approaching Heather's car. Expert witnesses were called to explain the forensic findings, including the fibers from the wig and sunglasses and Jenna's DNA found in the vehicle. The text messages between Jenna and the unknown number were displayed, revealing the chilling plan to remove Heather from Stephen and Carson's lives. These messages, coupled with entries from Jenna's journal, provided a haunting glimpse into her mindset and her calculated intentions. Key witnesses took the stand to recount their interactions with both Heather and Jenna. Lisa, Heather's best friend, shared Heather's fears and suspicions about being watched, which in hindsight pointed towards Jenna's stalking behavior. Colleagues from the florist shop spoke of Heather's increasing anxiety and the strained relationship with her mother-in-law. The most poignant testimony came from Stephen Strube, who, despite his complex relationship with Heather, expressed his horror and disbelief at his mother's actions. His testimony added a layer of emotional weight to the prosecution's case, underscoring the devastating impact of Jenna's actions on his family. The defense, determined to cast doubt on the prosecution's narrative, argued that the evidence was circumstantial and insufficient to conclusively prove Jenna's guilt. They claimed that the surveillance footage was blurry and the eyewitness accounts were inconsistent, pointing out discrepancies in descriptions of the disguised figure. The defense also attempted to undermine the credibility of the forensic evidence, suggesting that the fibers and DNA could have been transferred unintentionally due to Jenna's frequent visits to her relative's house, where the dark sedan was kept. They portrayed Jenna as a devoted grandmother who, despite having disagreements with Heather, would never resort to violence. In an attempt to humanize their client, the defense called character witnesses who spoke of Jenna's caring nature and her dedication to her family, emphasizing the implausibility of her being capable of such a heinous crime. They also introduced the possibility of another suspect, someone who might have exploited the tensions within the family to orchestrate the murder and frame Jenna. This line of defense aimed to introduce reasonable doubt 
suggesting alternative scenarios that could explain the evidence presented by the prosecution. Throughout the trial, the jury listened attentively, weighing the arguments and evidence from both sides. The courtroom atmosphere was charged with tension as each witness testified and each piece of evidence was scrutinized. The closing arguments from both the prosecution and defense encapsulated the emotional and factual arguments that had been laid out over the course of the trial. The prosecution urged the jury to see through the defense's attempts to muddy the waters and to focus on the clear, overwhelming evidence of Jenna's guilt. The defense, on the other hand, appealed to the jury's sense of fairness, arguing that the gaps and inconsistencies in the prosecution's case warranted a verdict of not guilty. After several days of deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. The courtroom fell silent as the foreperson stood to deliver the decision. Jenna Wall was found guilty of the premeditated murder of Heather Stroop. The verdict was met with a mix of relief and sorrow from Heather's family and friends, who had endured the painful process of seeking justice for their loved one. Jenna showed little emotion as she was led away, her fate sealed by the weight of the evidence against her. The trial of Jenna Wall not only brought closure to a grieving family, but also served as a stark reminder of the dark complexities that can lurk within familial relationships. The court proceedings and trial had exposed the depths of Jenna's vendetta and her willingness to go to extreme lengths to achieve her goals. In the end, justice was served for Heather Stroop, her memory honored through the diligent efforts to bring her killer to account. The motive behind Heather Stroop's tragic murder lay in a bitter and escalating custody battle over her beloved son, Carson. The tension surrounding Carson's custody had been brewing for months, with both Heather and her estranged husband, Stephen, fiercely advocating for what they believed was in their son's best interest. Stephen was dissatisfied with the custody arrangement that limited his time with Carson and felt that Heather was using their son to maintain control over him. This growing dissatisfaction, coupled with his fiery temperament, created a volatile situation that Jenna Wall, Stephen's mother, saw as an opportunity to intervene. Jenna Wall's involvement in the custody dispute was driven by her deep-seated desire to secure her grandson's future. She was convinced that Heather was an unfit mother and that Carson would be better off being raised by Stephen and herself. Jenna's domineering personality meant that she often clashed with Heather over parenting decisions, leading to bitter arguments. Jenna believed that by removing Heather from the equation, she could ensure that Carson would be brought up in a stable environment under her influence. The custody battle was marked by heated legal proceedings and personal confrontations. Heather, determined to provide the best for Carson, stood her ground against Jenna's relentless attempts to undermine her. Despite the strains, Heather always maintained a composed demeanor, focusing on Carson's well-being. However, behind closed doors, the stress took its toll on her. Friends and family noted Heather's growing anxiety and the subtle changes in her behavior as she navigated the turbulent waters of the custody dispute. Jenna's motives were further fueled by her belief that Heather was attempting to alienate Carson from his paternal family. She perceived any effort by Heather to move forward with her life and create a new future for herself and Carson as a direct threat. Jenna's resentment intensified with each court ruling that favored Heather, leading to a sense of desperation. She felt powerless in the face of a legal system that seemed to side with Heather, and this helplessness 
transformed into a chilling resolve to take matters into her own hands. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Jenna's behavior became increasingly erratic. She exhibited signs of obsessive behavior, fixating on Heather's every move. Jenna's journal entries revealed her growing frustration and a disturbing sense of entitlement over Carson's future. The texts exchanged between Jenna and an unknown number hinted at a sinister plan to resolve the custody dispute by eliminating Heather. Jenna's misguided belief that she was acting in Carson's best interest blinded her to the monstrous nature of her actions. The climax of this custody battle took a dark turn when Jenna, driven by her distorted sense of righteousness, decided to carry out her plan. The murder was not a spontaneous act of violence, but a calculated effort to remove Heather and secure custody of Carson for Stephen and herself. Jenna's decision to disguise herself and meticulously plan, the attack underscored the premeditated nature of her actions. She believed that by eradicating Heather, she could manipulate the legal system to grant Stephen full custody with her as the guiding force in Carson's upbringing. In the aftermath of Heather's murder, the true extent of Jenna's obsession and desperation came to light. The custody battle, which should have been a process to determine the best interest of a child, had been twisted into a motive for murder. Heather's life was cut short by a grandmother's dark desire for control, leaving a community in shock and a young boy without his mother. The tragic end to this custody dispute highlighted the devastating consequences of unchecked obsession and the lengths some will go to assert their perceived right over the lives of others. The public reaction and media frenzy surrounding Heather Strube's murder were immediate and intense. News of the tragedy spread like wildfire, captivating the attention of local and national media outlets. The senseless killing of a young mother in broad daylight, in the seemingly safe environment of a suburban parking lot, struck a chord with the public, triggering an outpouring of grief and outrage. The community, once known for its tranquility, now found itself at the center of a media storm, with reporters and news vans flooding the streets eager to cover every development of the case. Local news stations were the first to report on the incident, providing continuous updates as new details emerged. Interviews with witnesses, emotional tributes from friends and family, and expert commentary dominated the airwaves. The dramatic narrative of a beloved mother being gunned down in front of her child was both heartbreaking and compelling, drawing viewers in and eliciting strong emotional responses. As the investigation progressed, the coverage only intensified, with national networks picking up the story and turning it into a headline-grabbing saga. The media frenzy was fueled by the shocking twists and turns in the investigation. The revelation of Jenna Wall as the prime suspect combined with the scandalous motive rooted in a bitter custody battle, added layers of intrigue that the public could not ignore. News programs dedicated special segments to the case, dissecting the evidence, speculating on the motives, and interviewing legal experts about potential outcomes. The trial itself became a spectacle, with cameras capturing every moment from the opening statements to the final verdict. The trial was broadcasted live, allowing viewers to follow the proceedings in real time, further amplifying the media attention. Social media played a significant role in shaping public opinion and maintaining the high level of interest in the case. Hashtags related to Heather Strube and her murder trended on various platforms, with users sharing their thoughts, theories, and emotional reactions. 
Online petitions demanding justice for Heather gained thousands of signatures, reflecting the widespread impact the case had on the public consciousness. Discussion forums and comment sections buzzed with activity as people debated the details of the case, exchanged news updates and expressed their solidarity with Heather's family. The intense media coverage and public interest also had a profound effect on those directly involved in the case. Heather's family found themselves thrust into the spotlight, their private grief now a public spectacle. Friends and neighbors were interviewed repeatedly, their memories and emotions laid bare for the world to see. The pressure on law enforcement to solve the case quickly and efficiently was immense, with every breakthrough or setback scrutinized by an eager audience. Jenna Wall's family, too, faced the relentless glare of the media, their lives dissected and judged by a public hungry for answers. While the overwhelming public interest helped keep the case in the forefront of people's minds, it also brought challenges. The constant media presence led to concerns about the impact on the trial's fairness, with both the prosecution and defense wary of how the extensive coverage might influence jurors. The court took measures to ensure that the proceedings remained as impartial as possible, but the pervasive media buzz was impossible to ignore. In the end, the public reaction and media frenzy surrounding Heather Strube's murder underscored the profound impact of her tragic death. The case not only highlighted the vulnerabilities and dangers lurking in seemingly safe environments, but also the deep emotional connections that strangers can feel towards victims of such heinous crimes. The relentless coverage ensured that Heather's story resonated far beyond her local community, turning her into a symbol of the fight for justice and the devastating consequences of unchecked obsession and violence. The collective grief and outrage fueled a demand for accountability, a quest that ultimately led to the courtroom where Heather's killer was brought to justice, providing a measure of closure to a community and a nation deeply affected by her story. The impact on Heather's family was profound and heartbreaking. The sudden and violent nature of her death left a lasting scar on everyone who loved her. Her parents, who had always been a source of strength for Heather, found themselves struggling to cope with an unimaginable loss. Heather's mother, previously known for her warm and nurturing nature, was now haunted by grief and sorrow. She often spent hours quietly flipping through photo albums, her eyes lingering on images of Heather's radiant smile. Each picture was a painful reminder of the daughter she would never see again, the life and dreams that had been so cruelly taken away. Heather's father, a man of stoic demeanor, found it increasingly difficult to maintain his composure. The weight of his loss was evident in the deep lines etched into his face, each one telling a story of sleepless nights and endless pain. He withdrew from social gatherings, finding solace only in long solitary walks, hoping the physical exertion would somehow quiet the turmoil within. Friends and family reached out, but comfort was a fleeting sentiment that rarely tempered the rawness of his grief. Carson, Heather's young son, was perhaps the most affected by her untimely death. At such a tender age, he couldn't fully grasp the permanence of his loss. He often asked when his mommy would be coming back, his innocent questions tearing at the hearts of those who had to answer him. Heather's absence left a void in Carson's life that no one else could fill. He became quieter, more withdrawn, clinging to his grandparents for comfort. His once bright and carefree demeanor was overshadowed by a pervasive sadness that belied his years. His nights were often restless, 
disturbed by nightmares that echoed the trauma of that fateful day. Heather's friends and colleagues also bore the brunt of her loss, each grappling with their own feelings of sorrow and helplessness. Lisa, Heather's best friend, was particularly devastated. She had lost not just a friend, but a confidante and a sister in all but blood. Lisa often found herself reaching for the phone to call Heather, only to be struck by the harsh reality that those calls could never be made again. Her grief was compounded by guilt, feeling she could have done more to protect Heather or to heed her concerns about being watched. This sense of powerlessness and regret gnawed at her, making the grieving process even more arduous. Heather's colleagues at the florist shop where she had poured so much of her creativity and passion, were left in a state of collective mourning. The shop, once filled with the vibrant energy and laughter Heather brought, now felt hollow and somber. Her absence was a constant reminder of the fragility of life, and her co-workers struggled to find joy in the work that once brought them together. The beautiful arrangements Heather used to make now stood as silent tributes to her memory, each petal a testament to a life that had blossomed so briefly. The broader community also felt the impact of Heather's loss. Neighbors who had seen her cheerful face regularly were now confronted by the grim reality of her absence. Heather's death served as a stark reminder of the unpredictability and cruelty of life shaking the community's sense of safety and normalcy. Memorial services and vigils were held, where stories and memories of Heather were shared, but they did little to ease the underlying pain and sense of injustice that pervaded the hearts of those who attended. The psychological repercussions were long-lasting, with many of Heather's loved ones requiring professional support to navigate their grief. Counseling sessions became a regular part of their lives, offering a space to express the complex emotions that swirled within them. Yet, despite the support, the path to healing was slow and fraught with setbacks. Heather's family and friends were left to rebuild their lives around the aching void she had left behind, each day a painful reminder of the vibrant soul that had been so tragically extinguished. Heather Strube's death was not just a personal loss for her family and friends. It was a communal tragedy that left an indelible mark on all who knew her. The echoes of her life and the impact of her untimely death served as a poignant reminder of the preciousness of loved ones and the fragility of human connections. In their grief, Heather's family and friends found strength in each other striving to honor her memory by living with the kindness and love she had epitomized, even as they struggled to come to terms with the senseless act that had taken her away. The verdict in the trial of Jenna Wall was met with bated breath by all those who had followed the case so closely. After days of deliberation, the jury returned to the courtroom, their expressions solemn, the gravity of their decision evident. As the foreperson stood to deliver the verdict, the tension in the room was palpable. The jury found Jenna Wall guilty on all charges, including first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The announcement was a moment of collective exhale, a culmination of weeks of emotional and legal battles that had gripped the community. Heather's family, seated together in the front row, held each other tightly, tears streaming down their faces. The weight of their loss mixed with the relief that justice had finally been served for their beloved Heather. Jenna Wall, standing to hear the judgment, maintained a stoic facade, but the impact of the verdict was undeniable. The judge's sentencing remarks underscored the premeditated nature of Jenna's crime. Condemning her actions and highlighting the profound impact her act of violence had on an innocent family. The sentencing handed down 
was life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, a decision that aimed to reflect the severity of her actions and provide a measure of closure to those left in mourning. The courtroom, which had been a space of intense scrutiny and emotional turmoil, fell silent as the reality of the sentence settled in. For Heather's family and friends, the verdict brought a sense of justice, a recognition of Heather's life and the senseless nature of her death. In the following days, the community grappled with the aftermath of the verdict. While the trial had come to an end, the echoes of its proceedings and the tragedy that precipitated it lingered. Heather's loved ones found some solace in the thought that her killer would be held accountable, yet the pain of her absence remained a deep scar. As they continued to honor her memory, they drew strength from the support of their community, united by a shared hope for healing and remembrance. The conclusion of the trial marked a significant chapter in the story of Heather Stroob, a testament to the resilience and unwavering pursuit of justice by those who loved her. Her legacy lived on in the hearts of her family, friends, and all those who had been touched by her story, a poignant reminder of the enduring impact one life can have, even in the face of unimaginable tragedy. The aftermath of Heather Strube's tragic murder rippled through her community and beyond, prompting profound reflection and significant changes. In the wake of such a heinous act, the local and state governments took immediate steps to address the vulnerabilities that had been laid bare. One of the most notable changes was the implementation of enhanced security measures in public spaces particularly in large parking lots and shopping centers. Surveillance systems were upgraded, increasing the number and quality of cameras to ensure better coverage and clarity. This move was aimed at deterring potential criminals and providing law enforcement with vital tools to quickly respond to and investigate any incidents that might occur. Furthermore, the community rallied together to create initiatives aimed at protecting victims of domestic violence and stalking. Heather's case highlighted the need for more robust protective measures and support systems for individuals embroiled in custody battles or dealing with separation from potentially volatile partners. Local organizations partnered with law enforcement and social services to introduce more comprehensive safety plans, including mandatory check-ins and the use of panic buttons and emergency apps for those at risk. These changes were designed to provide real-time assistance and increase the sense of security for those who might otherwise feel isolated and vulnerable. Legislatively, Heather's tragic death spurred state lawmakers into action. They introduced and successfully passed new legislation aimed at tightening the laws surrounding the use of disguises during criminal activities, making it a more severe offense to use such measures to commit violent crimes. This legislation, often referred to as Heather's Law, received widespread support from both political parties and advocacy groups. The law also included provisions for harsher penalties for crimes involving the premeditated stalking and targeting of individuals. Recognizing the calculated nature of such acts and the profound impact they have on victims and their families. On a more personal level, the community impact was deeply felt. Heather's neighbors, friends, and even strangers were moved to action creating a wave of support and advocacy that extended beyond the immediate aftermath of her murder. Fundraisers and memorial events were organized to support Carson and Heather's family, ensuring that they had the financial and emotional resources needed to heal and move forward. These events also served as a platform for raising awareness about the signs of domestic violence 
and the importance of community vigilance in preventing such tragedies. Educational programs in schools and community centers were introduced, focusing on conflict resolution, healthy relationships, and the warning signs of abusive behavior. These programs aim to educate the younger generation and the broader community, fostering a culture of empathy, awareness, and proactive intervention. By addressing these issues at the grassroots level, the community hoped to prevent future incidents and create a safer environment for all its members. The reflection on Heather's life and the circumstances of her untimely death also led to a deeper appreciation of the importance of mental health support. Counseling services were expanded and more resources were allocated to provide accessible mental health care for individuals dealing with the stress and trauma of custody disputes and domestic issues. The community recognized that addressing these underlying issues was crucial in preventing violent outbursts and ensuring that families could navigate their conflicts in a healthy and constructive manner. In the end, the aftermath of Heather Strube's murder was marked by a community's resilience and determination to turn their grief into meaningful action. The changes in laws, security measures and community initiatives all served as a testament to Heather's enduring legacy, a commitment to ensuring that such a tragedy would not befall another family. As the community continued to heal and grow stronger, Heather's memory stood as a powerful reminder of the impact one life can have, inspiring efforts to create a safer, more compassionate world. In summary, the twisted nature of Heather Strube's murder reveals the darkest corners of human emotion and obsession. The case unraveled complex relationships, deep-seated animosities, and a chilling premeditation that left a lasting impact on everyone involved. Heather's life, once full of promise and love, was cruelly cut short by a sinister act masked by familial bonds. It's a haunting reminder that sometimes the greatest dangers can lurk behind the masks of those we trust most. As we reflect on this unsettling story, we remember Heather not just as a victim, but as a beloved mother, daughter, and friend whose memory continues to inspire change and vigilance. Let us hold our loved ones closer, always aware of the fragility of life and the importance of safeguarding our sense of community. We invite you to share your thoughts and feelings about this case in the comments below. Your perspectives can help us all process and understand the profound impact of such tragedies. If you found this story compelling, please like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated on more dark and twisted tales. Thank you for joining us in unraveling the disturbing threads of Heather Strube's story.